Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kitching, for the uh, kind introduction. My name is Liron. I'm from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, my lab is supervised by Professor Riel Levy here. Um, I'd like to speak to you today about our general plat platform called Atomic Collating Waveguides. Um, and basically, you can see like these kind of sketches here of, of two kind of uh, typical devices that we have, and I'll, of course, elaborate on them. Um, so in, in essence, this is a work of combining between integration, of combining the two worlds, the fantastic world of nanophotonics, and more specifically, I'll be speaking today about silicon photonics in general, and the well-known world of atomic physics. I don't have to tell people here too much about amazing things people can do with, with atomic physics. So the question is, can we integrate light and vapor in a chip-scale, nanoscale device, taking advantage, for instance, of the amazing things people can do in nanophotonics, enhancing light, isolating light, concentrating light to the nanoscale, of course, frequency cones that are mentioned much in this conference. And with atomic physics, so you have the two like very applicative kind of uh, uh, applications of frequency references and magnetometers, but other than that, there's many other kind of applications, and mainly in the in the academic world these days, like few photon switching, the uh, subset of all optical switching and uh, slow light, fast light, quantum computation, so on and so forth. So, can we actually combine these two worlds and bring upon chip scale kind of light vapor interactions? So the world of integrated and guided and free space kind of uh, apparatuses for uh, light vapor interactions is, is, is an uprise in the recent years. So first of all, there's all these millimeter sized cells. So our chairman, Kiching, has of course revolutionized this field. And I myself have been involved in a company in Israel in, in the miniaturizing kind of CPT kind of atomic clocks. Obviously also Symmetricum has, has a CSEC. Um, then you have like unconventional cells, that were what I call thin cells, micro cells, all kinds of weird and very interesting cells that have like lambda scale uh, thickness in this case. This is a group of Sargassian from Armenia. And they have very, very interesting uh, features. For instance, these kind of cells uh, exhibit Doppler free lines just in transmission without doing anything special. Um, and then there's a big effort in guiding light and vapor together. So few prominent examples, one would be the holocore photonic crystal fiber, starting with a group of Philip Russell. So here you have a, a, a special kind of fiber which has holes inside and guides the light uh, by, by reflecting light inside. And the rubidium and the vapor, uh, sorry, the rubidium and the light are in both uh, residing together. The equivalent of this concept has been demonstrated by Holger Schmidt on chip, these arrow wave guides. And once again, you have the, the vapor and the light uh, uh, combined together. And within these kind of platforms, people have shown both linear and nonlinear interactions. For instance, uh, Alexander Geddes' group recently has shown a few, few, few photon switching in, in these kind of platforms. Um, here, they that, have been shown slow and fast lights, so really fantastic platforms. Another different kind of platform, more uh, similar to what we're doing, is a taper nano, nanofiber. So here, what you do is you take a fiber and you taper it down to, let's say, 300 nanometers and you introduce rubidium around it. And once you do so, you have a very, very small mode. And people have shown in these, these platforms, mainly Salim Shakhriya for Northwestern University, he has shown a saturation of optical uh, transitions at around uh, a few tens of nanovats. So the question is, can you take this platform and make it a chip scale of an essence light vapor interaction kind of environment with the prominent uh, advantages of the fact that you can have in, in very fine integration, you can combine this with resonators, photonic crystals, so on and so forth. You can route the light and have all these advantages of the world of silicon photonics. So this is basically what we were doing. So my outline will basically go in between two different motivations. One would be optical references in a telecom near infrared regime. And the second would be low power all optical modulation with the ultimate goal of having few photon switching. So I'll be jumping between these two kind of motivations within the talk. Um, so the basic platform is what we coin atomic lighting waveguide. What we have here is a silicon nitride waveguide with the dimension shown here of something like 500 nanometers on 200 nanometers height. This is sitting on a silicon oxide platform. And in a specific region of space, as you can see I'm pointing here, we're etching out the silicon oxide that's covering the whole chip. And we have like a, a, a chamber, a small chamber that's defining the interaction region. 
Then we bond a rubidium cell to, the, to, this, to this chip uh, using, at, at the moment we're doing epoxy glue, in the future you want to, and collaborating with uh, Dr. Kitching for doing uh, this with anodic bonding. So the ultimate goal would have be have a, like a handheld chip where having a chamber within it. And yet, in the moment, this is a, also a handheld device. This is finished off and you can like really, really portable. You can see a picture here. This is not connected to the vacuum, although I, I cut the picture here. It's not connected to the vacuum. And we make them fairly long at the moment just because it's very convenient to do so. Um, so rubidium vapor is bouncing all around the, the, the waveguide and entering and exiting this evanescent region of approximately 100 nanometers and about, let's say, half a nanosecond. So that's something to recall. Uh, it's actually like the speed of an aeroplane going inside and inside, uh, outside this needle of light. It's quite remarkable that we actually managed to do something with that. Um, so in general, our group is doing many different kind of integration schemes, not only with the waveguide, also with ring resonators. I'll show some of that later. This is the work I'm showing today. And we also have some work on plasmonic light vapor interaction. So whoever's interested, you can see some of our papers in this field. Um, but at the end of the day, as I mentioned before, what we want to do is to have this kind of chip it doesn't have that, 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 that cell integrated. It's like a self, uh, these kind of chambers within the, the, the silicon uh, platform. So going to the, so some of the results, these are the atomic line waveguide, the first generations. What you can see here is free space normal spectroscopy within a, a natural rubidium uh, cell. You can see 87, 85 lines, and 87 lines again. And what you see here in the bottom is the guided wave uh, light vapor interaction system. So what's quite striking at the beginning, you can see you have broadening. So there's two prominent broadening mechanisms within these waveguides. One would be transit time broadening. This is due to the fact that I mentioned before that the uh, atoms and the light are interacting within approximately an average of one nanosecond. So that gives rise to transit time broadening due to the fact that lifetime of these transitions is around 30 nanoseconds. And the second and more prominent, uh, but not as fundamental, I suppose, uh, broadening mechanism would be the Doppler broadening, but this would be additional Doppler broadening. So usually you have like k dot v, that's your, that's your Doppler shift, and as the fact that k vector in these kind of devices is higher in the factor of 1.5 approximately in the factor of the effective index of the mode, then we have more Doppler broadening. So obviously these two things are very important for metrology applications, and of course they're, they're not as good as what you would have in free space, but there are some ways maybe we could go around that. That's one thing. Nevertheless, we still get one gigahertz line width. This is an on-chip cell that you could get a, an atomic line in reference. That's, that, that, that's a, a nice kind of thing to have. Um, second very interesting thing in these kind of systems is the nonlinear effects you can see right here. So these results I showed you here are done with approximately one nanovat of uh, light within the waveguide. And once you crank up the power, let's say, to 10 microvats, you can see I'm saturating the transition totally. This is an optical pumping, actually. It's quite interesting. This is a real kind of two-level system because the system doesn't have time to evolve to other levels. So it's really like a two-level system trapped in time. Um, so once I pump up the power, you can see I'm really saturating it. When you plot the contrast, let's say, of this stronger line as function of, of power, you can see the onset of saturation is around 40 nanovats, so obviously very, very low. And one can view this as the onset of, in general for all kinds of nonlinear interactions, as I'll show soon. So this was the first version. The second version, we take these, this waveguide and we made it much longer, um, seven times longer, actually. You can do it much even longer, like, for, for instance, Kerry Vahala's group has, and Caltech has, like, one meter uh, waveguides on chips. So the main reason to make it longer is also to enhance the nonlinearities, to accumulate them across the long distance. The second is a very technical issue, but very important for us. Um, all these glues that we introduced here have outgassing and the lifetime of these devices, although it was was fairly not bad in, in respect to the other people in the community, but still a few months. So with these, we can operate in lower temperatures, say 65 degrees in this case, and, and get still uh, sufficient contrast. Uh, so that's very important for us. These devices actually are still living, still working after uh, I think at least a year and a half. So if you look at the, uh, the, the interaction region, the effective interaction region, you have like five, let's stop working. You have 5 to the 10 to the minus 4 millimeter cubed uh, atomic cell, which is obviously very small. This is a chip layout, so you have different kind of waveguides on the same chip, just to show you how these things look like. Um, so the first, the results with this, once again, they mimic the ones I showed you before. This is rubidium 85, and the reference in blue is rubidium 80, 87, natural rubidium. 
we have also nice stereo, as you can see here. Once again, we uh, replicate the saturation. We have something like 100 nanovat saturation. And another interesting thing that you can notice here, maybe you have a small van der Waals shift from these lines, of something like 50 megahertz. So this, of course, has consequences on, on metrology. And specifically, the, the more interesting question is, what is the temperature coefficient of this van der Waals uh, shift? And frankly, we don't know. So this is something we want to measure and has uh, consequences for metrology, as I mentioned before. Um, so moving on to the nonlinear uh, interactions, what you can see here is a free space arrangement with 780 and 795, like a pump probe arrangement. So basically, we're pumping with 780 and we're probing with a 795. And what you can see here is a combination of also velocity selective optical pumping and also EAT that contributes to these, these lines. Um, um, and depending whether you're tuned from 780 from the upper ground state or the bottom ground state, you get these peaks or these dips. This is like a free space experiment. And now going into the, the, the guided uh, mode experiment with our atomic cladding waveguide, once again with these long ones, the serpentine ones. So you can see something slightly different. So you can see, once again the laser, okay. You can see that uh, this, this is a 795 transition in blue, uh, just without the pump, the pump is turned off. And once I turn the pump on, to something like 14 microvats per pump within the waveguide, you can see I'm totally shutting down this transition, accompanied with this kind of uh, peak, which is an actually an or town splitting peak. Um, and in the other, other side here, you can see I'm, I'm actually shifting uh, the, the resonance, and this is actually light shift of the 780 nanometer acting on the ground state itself. This is a huge light shift of approximately like 200 megahertz. Uh, due to the fact that we have these very high rabbi frequencies within our waveguide, something like two gigahertz, this is also apparent by the splitting, this also the town splitting. Another very important thing to say here is that these are actually this this switching that we're we're, we're interested here, and we of course want the highest contrast. The switching is highly assisted by coherent effects. And this is something that in the beginning, when we started this field, people were telling us it might not be able to achieve. But actually, if you think about it, if we're if we're like pushing our system and, and faster than the decoherence of the system, which is the transit time broadening, then obviously we can do that. And that's what's happening here. We're actually um, operating in high rabbi frequencies. This is due to the fact that we have, we have lots of intensity within our, our waveguide still with very low power. So this is like 10 microvats and still getting like 2 gigahertz of, of rabbi frequencies. Um, so going more about this. So we have, uh, if when we crank up the power slowly, once again, you get this whole switching uh, uh, phenomenon. You can get also uh, less, obviously, if you have uh, less power. Uh, I want to stress that the contrast itself of the transition is dependent on the temperature we're using. Here I was using 65 degrees. Obviously, if I have longer waveguides, if I have higher temperatures, we can have much larger switching, practically to, to, to zero. Um, this is the light shift going more or less linearly um, as expected and with, with a well-known formula. And these are like theory uh, curves simulating all the quenching effects of the, the vapor when it hits the surface and the transit time broadening and the enhanced Doppler and so on and so forth. And showing in this figure is when I turn off, um, in, in simulation of course, I turn off the coherence term in the density matrix and this is when it's on. You can see that it doesn't matter how much power I crank here, I, I won't be able to do more than 50%, which is, of course, a saturation effect. You can't go more than that in absence of optical pumping that we really showed here that you don't have optical pumping. Um, also, you can see the fact that we don't have optical pumping with the fact that this transition doesn't change its contrast as opposed to, the, to this transition that you can see here in the free space uh, configuration. Uh, and when you, you turn on the, once again, simulation, very easy to do so, <laughs> When you turn on the density matrix uh, coherence uh, element, then you can see that you really get this whole swing of, of transition. So th th what we're claiming here is that we actually have a coherent effect which is driving the transition faster than the transit time. So can you actually further enhance these effects? So recently, like a few weeks ago, a month or so, we introduced a ring resonator within our system. This ring resonator has a Q factor of approximately 20,000. And I'll drive you through this, this, this slide. So we are actually enhancing the effect I showed you before. And this demonstration was in a factor of five, corresponding more or less to some kind of effective finesse of, of five as well, which is, which is the builder factor of a ring resonator. 
And you can see the same thing I showed you before, just we're now having power of instead of 14 microvats, we have three microvats. So this is an improvement. And obviously, this is like a proof of concept. If you have higher finesses, which is obviously people have, have done in many groups, then you can get down to hopefully what we're hoping to go to the sub nanovat regime, which will really be in the few photon switching regime. So you can really switch off and off on light, say with one photon. So once again, what you're seeing here, you see here is the effect when you're tuned with your 780 nanometer to the ring resonator resonance. And here is when you're detuned from the ring resonator resonance, you can see the effect is diminished. So you have a very strong effect of, of the cavity itself to enhance this, this effect. Um, finally, two slides about our prospects of using these kind of systems for two photon absorption of the telecom band. So uh, there's, there's actually a transition in rubidium um, in the telecom band 1529. Uh, 1, so you have to pump it for 780 for the ground side, then you have to follow that for the, this transition. So actually these waveguides, these atomic cladding waveguides I showed you before support both, both modes. You can see the different simulated modes here. And we had some kind of preliminary results. Nevertheless, in smaller cells, once again, cells that are like uh, ones that are introduced by John Kitchen's group, then you have um, these transitions we have shown here. You have the, this peak. This is actually monitoring the 780 in this case, and the error signal. And we have been locking these, these, these devices and reached at the moment something like 10 to the minus 10, and we're still improving. The thing is we had some kind of buffer gas uh, residuals inside the, the, the cells that, that, that had some uh, effects of, of course, uh, pressure broadening, um, so we're still pushing forward to, to work with this. Um, so I would like to summarize. I showed you a new platform of the serpentine tonic cladding wing, this long one that is complementary to our shorter ones. They were like 1.5 millimeter before. This is 17 millimeters. They operate with 25% absorption at 65 degrees. I showed you all optical modulation assisted by coherent effect at the microvite towers and a little bit about telecom references in millimeter-sized cells. So thank you very much for your attention.